Welcome back, dear viewer, to Mostly Racing, and welcome to the final Gordon Bennett Cup race. Unlike the last race, I won't spend too much time on the competitors and background details, as there is a full race write-up available from the automobile from 1905, which is very helpful for me, and fascinating, as I haven't read anything like it from the races preceding this one. Please like and subscribe to appease the almighty YouTube algorithm, and let's just get into it. <laughs> Potentially out of honour for the mighty Michelin tyres, which carried the French and Terry to Gordon Bennett's glory, the HCF decided that the route would pass by the headquarters of the French tyre manufacturer in the Auvergne region of central France. I like to think Babendum was waving at the competitors through the HQ windows. Bet you didn't know the Michelin man had an actual name, did you? A lovely tribute to the pneumatic brand, but a stupid one. The Germans, who hosted the previous cup, chose a route which had good infrastructure and accessibility, whereas the French chose one which was none of the above. Twisty and mountainous, with some 3,000 corners per lap to navigate, some of which necessitated three-point turns. Good stuff. Lap one of this monster was approximately 85 miles, or 137 kilometers, which the drivers would have to navigate four times. Representing the British, we have the overdue appearance of Clifford Earp in an Napier after he won the trials and didn't oik around afterwards. He was joined by Charles Rolls and Cecil Bianchi, driving Wallersleys. Charles Rolls and Henry Royce had already started their own car company at this point, so I'm not too sure why he didn't enter in one of his own machines, and as far as I can tell, this is the only race of note Cecil Bianchi competed in. For Italy, it's friends of the show Vincenzo Lancia and Alessandro Cagno, who were joined by a very fine racing driver in the form of Felice Nazaro. Born in Turin on the 4th of December 1881, Nazaro inadvertently left a profound impact on motorsport when his performance at the 1908 Circuito de Bologna inspired a young Enzo Ferrari to take up motor racing. Also, get used to hearing the name Nazaro for the next few racing history videos. All three were in Fiat's. United States of A. Driving Pope Toledo's, it's Herbert Lytle and the best name in the race, Bert Dingley. Lytle had some dirt track racing experience and would race in the 1911 Indy 500 where he crashed in the pits. While Dingley would become the American racing champion in 1909. Until, and this was news to me, in 1951 he was retrospectively stripped of the title when the point system was reworked for the seasons from 1902 to 1908. Can I get some justice for Dingley's in the comments please? The final driver was Joe Tracy in a locomobile. Born in Ireland but living in the States since he was 19, Tracy benefited from the change of the point system in 1951 as he was named the 1906 American National Champion, which is nice. The early days of American racing is a grey area for me, so I'm hesitant to go into further detail, but it's something I can look into and make a video on if people would want to see that. Germany, the Belgian regulars, Camille Genazzi and Baron Pierre de Carters. They were also joined by a new name to us, but one we should get familiar with, Christian Lautenschlager. The German had been training to be a mechanic since the age of 14, and got himself a job at the Daimler factory by the age of 22. He worked his way up the ranks to become test driver, and now, by the age of 28, a driving seat in a major race. Don't want to give too much away about his career, but this man has a legacy. Austria. It is Edgar Brown alongside Otto Hieronymus. Otto Mann here was born in Germany, and seems to have been a hill climb specialist. I mean, he won the Exelberg hill climb near Wien three times. I'm sure that's probably impressive. The third driver, we don't have a first name for. They're just called Burton. Well, that's something I can say for certain, as it's the only thing my different sources can agree upon. One lists him as Alexander Burton, and another Joseph Burton Alexander, so I don't know. Both German and Austrian teams used Mercedes. The reigning champions, the French. Of course, the winner in 1904 was back. Leon Terry in his trusted Richard Brazier, as he also won the French Cup trials. No stopping him, it seems. He was joined by brandmate Gustave Calois, who was just getting into car racing at this time. Cycle racing and motorbike racing had been his calling up to this point. The final driver to introduce is the American-born, Belgian-bred Frenchman Arthur Dure, who is most well known for breaking the land speed record on two separate occasions. His first attempt in July 1903 
made him the first person to exceed the railway speed record when he averaged 83 miles per hour, 132 kilometers an hour, over a kilometer. On to the race now, which took place on the 5th of July, 1905. The write-up from this race comes from a publication called The Automobile from the 20th of July, 1905, which I have accessed from the Sports Car Digest website, which is linked below in the description, if I've remembered. I don't have a name for the author, but they're dead, so I'm pretty sure they won't come after me. France again holds the Gordon Bennett Cup. Such is the outcome of the sixth, the most exciting, the most keenly contested, and the most surprising of all the races yet held for this much-valued trophy. Not only does France hold the cup, but the previous year's winner is again the victor. This is a record for never before has the race been won twice by the same man. Terry must be, indeed, a proud man the day. But the most important feature of the race is not the victory for France, but the remarkable performance of Italy and the collapse of the Mercedes competitors. When the race began, it was thought by all and feared by France that the victor would be from amongst one of the six Mercedes cars present. And amongst this formidable set of men, Ginazzi was generally regarded as the most likely winner. Less than an hour had to elapse to show the French that their fears were ill-founded, and at the end of the first round, they discovered that the struggle was to lay between them and Italy, one of the latest arrivals to automobitism, which word doesn't recognise as a word. Lancia's Fiat car made the most remarkable performance of the day. When the second round was finished, he was leading on Terry by 13 minutes, and during the third round, this lead was still further increased. Whilst going very fast, and at a moment when victory seemed almost certain, a stone from the road struck the lower part of the radiator and started a leak that allowed the cooling water to escape quickly. As a consequence, the motor became overheated and the car was brought to a standstill. Thus, by the merest chance, the race was made secure for France. Lancia's misfortune did not, however, destroy Italy's position, for the other two cars were doing remarkably well, and came in respectively second and third, with a lead of 7 minutes 57 seconds and 1 fifth, and 5 minutes 43 seconds and 4 fifths on Calois Richard Brazier. Although Italy has not won the cup, Fiat's cars have obtained for it a victory no less important than that secured by Terry. 12 of the 18 cars were officially classified. Of these, France has three occupying 1st, 4th and 6th positions, and securing it for the Montague Prize for team classification, which I didn't realise was the thing. Italy 2, taking 2nd and 3rd place. England, as opposed to Britain, 3, placed respectively 8th, 9th and 11th. Germany 2, in the 5th and 7th position. Austria 1, placed 10th on the list, and America 1, taking 12th position. Lytle performed the pluckiest feat of the day, disheartened on the first round by an accident to his lubricator, which would have caused most men to abandon immediately. With dogged determination, he stuck to his task, and finally brought his car into the finish. Afterward, when they weighed in both Lytle and his mechanician, Nipper, were covered in a thick coating of grease, which rendered them unrecognisable, while the machine was aflood with oil. For the last three rounds, they had been blinded by gallons of oil splashing into their faces. Nipper's drab suit had changed to a shiny black under its coating of oil and dust. America's failure is due to the sending of machines of too low horsepower, the Pope Toledo's engines only delivering half the power of the French and German machines, and not sufficiently studying the special nature of the course over which the race had to be run. Nothing but praise is due to the French club for the admirable way in which the race was organised and carried out. The course was a most dangerous one, yet, thanks to the foresight of the officials and the careful way in which the road was guarded by troops, not a single accident or mishap of any kind marred the day. The cup is no sooner won than the question has to be faced as to what will be done with it. By its revolution, revolutions. By its resolution of a few days ago, France cannot take part in next year's race. It is probable that a meeting of delegates from all automobile clubs will meet in Paris very shortly, that the cup will be given back to James Gordon Bennett, and some decision reached as to future contests. Great write up 1905 author person. So yes, Terry had won the cup back to back, the only person to accomplish this feat. This also meant the French had won the cup four out of six times, so it really is no wonder they wanted to hammer home that their automotive industry was number one. The ACF indeed gave the cup back to the titular Gordon Bennett, 
who swapped out car racing for hot air balloon racing. The 2021 champions are Switzerland, by the way. The ACF then announced they would organise their own high-profile race, with no limits on how many cars can enter from a single nation. But, with no cup, how could they entice a high number of premier entrants? They would achieve this by offering a grand prize. Or, as they would say, a Grand Prix. Thank you for watching. Mostly racing is a solo endeavour by yours truly, so if you're willing and able, please head over to my Patreon page and follow my Twitter. Thank you again, and I'll see you for my review of the 1999 Canadian Grand Prix.